Do you read Stephen King? Good news, there's a club for you, the Losers Club. Every Friday, us losers journey through the never-ending wastelands of King's Dominion. We sink our teeth into each of King's novels, dive deep into the lore, and review every adaptation. Even better, we're always having guests over. Thomas Jane, Will Wheaton, Mary Lambert, Mick Garris, the list goes on. So what are you waiting for? Join us as we read on through long days and pleasant nights. Consequence Podcast Network. Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with... It's an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks to everyone who checks in multiple times a week with all the interviews to all the subscribers out there. Hopefully, if you get inspired, you can uh, you can give the series a rating to maybe leave a review. And if you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button. Do not wait any longer. We uh, premiere new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists' comings and goings. Just head to wherever you get your podcast from. Type in Kyle Meredith with and subscribe away. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest is one of my all-time favorite artists, Kim Gordon. Yes, you know her from Sonic Youth. You might even know her from the art world that she's been such an integral part of for at least like 35, 40 years. And now she finally has her debut solo album, No Home Record. Kim and I are going to talk about the commercialization of art and writing in pop structures for the first time in like 10 years. As for the past few, she's also been in Body Head with Bill Nace. That's more of an improv, a noise group. So what's it been like coming back to these kind of structures? We'll get into her love and history of hip-hop from the New York scene in the 80s, recently becoming a Fleetwood Mac fan, and whether or not the lyrics on this record updates where she left off on her autobiography, Girl in a Band. She's also planning on taking this out on the road, and we'll talk about what that live band is going to be like and what that live show, what we can expect from that as well. Talking about this record, no home record, it's Kyle Meredith with Kim Gordon. Hey. I don't have to say that I'm a huge fan, and I've been waiting for this record for a long time, but I am a huge fan, and I've been waiting for this record for a long time, and it sounds so good. I'm so oh, happy. Yeah, I'm. I'm so happy to hear this. Uh, this solo record. Congratulations on this. It's awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. Glad you like it. Yeah, I was reading an interview with you recently as you're talking about this, and and I'm taking it out of context a little bit. But you said art is at its most commercial right now, and and I think you were talking about decorative arts along the lines of the Airbnb stuff. But um, I kind of wonder though, if that's the case, do you find that that also influences how you come about to a record like this? Well. I mean, I was, I was, um, you did take it out of context. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, no, well, I was talking about the New York art world as being um, more commercial than it's ever been. And maybe I was contrasting it with LA, which isn't as commercial because Hollywood money isn't like Wall Street money. But um, I mean, the Airbnb um, thing is more about, I guess, seeing how people, what people's idea of art is, is, I mean, obviously they're decorating their house and they're treating art. There is a lot of high art that is basically decoration or once you see it in a corporate lobby or something, it doesn't really have any, I don't know, often it just looks like decoration to me. Then, you know, when you use prints and reproductions of paintings, and it is become something else and then when it matches the bedspread and the towels and the rugs and and you get kind of semblances of what might have been African art which is now like a porcelain elephant or something <laughs> like in some I don't know it's just kind of interesting to me maybe I'm just a sociologist and <laughs> well I, I guess and what I was of course trying to do was tie back to the music because you know in the in the past few years you've put out these really amazing records with with body head which you know finds you in more of a freeform structure you know it, it's a lot of improv in that and this takes you back mm-hmm. to the pops you know it, it, I guess we can call it this a pop structure is closer to what you're in now. And not that you have to pick one or the other, but do you find that you're more comfortable in one than the other? Well, they're just different. I mean, playing with Bill Nace and Body Head, it's just kind of fun, pure fun. And, um, you know, it's it doesn't um, have like all these... I mean, it has its own built-in expectations, I guess. If, if I, Maybe that's more for, from for Bill, or that he knows the scene more of like noise music and, and all that. But I don't really have to pay attention to it. So it's kind of freeing for me. And I don't know, this is just kind of um experiment. I you know, I do like um listen to I don't listen to that much pop music, but you know, there's I like rap and 
you know, I like songs and I've like, you know, I listen to all kinds of super mellow music from the past, you know, whether it's Neil Young or Fleetwood Mac, <laughs> Tusk, Steve Gunn and Carvile too. You know, like I, I don't, basically I don't sit down and put on a noise record at home so yeah. much. It's yeah. more something I'd go see as for the experience of it. Well, there's a, a Fleetwood Mac. You mentioned that they they get kind of a uh, a little nod in there, and it, it was Tusk, right? It was Tusk that you kind of uh, that, that led you to them. <laughs> Tusk, yeah. <laughs> that's an Their interesting most hated record. <laughs> it just turned forty. It's on its fortieth anniversary, I think, this week. Not that that's here nor there, but uh, it's it's kind of yeah. interesting that that's the one you centered in on. It's a cool that's record. Funny. It's different. Yeah, I mean it's weird. I mean I I hear Fleetwood Mac all over now. Like it's it's like you can't escape it. You'd also mention hip hop there for a second. Paprika Pony, I think it's really close to you know with that with that beat that's happening behind that. It reminds me of the mm-hmm. old school style. Uh, and you all were always early champions uh, of of hip hop and rap before it was widely accepted. Where did that come from for you? Was that mm-hmm. just primarily a New York thing and your accessibility to it? Yeah, I think so. Um, definitely, it was a New York thing. And um, and then you know, of course, God, I remember uh, talking to Rick Rubin when he was still an NYU student living in a dorm, and him he was telling me about he was going to record this like rap artist in his dorm room, and I was like, yeah, right, Rick. <laughs> And, uh, you know, like it just became, like, this huge producer. But, no, you know, I like, like, the LL Cool J's uh, radio. That that um, it was very minimal. And, you know, just, like, it's kind of in New York, you hear so much music pouring out of people's cars and just kind of a c- cacophony of uh, mixed genres at times. You know, Madonna and then some rap and... Uh-huh. Yeah. Run DMC. Was that uh, was that actually a touch point when you were going into a song like Paprika Pony, or is that is it coincidence? I mean, I I kind of um, you know I relate to hip hop or rappers per se as I'm not like a the best singer or like a biggest range or big on melody, more of a rhythm kind of person. I like the I like also that it, it's um it's kind of punk and that you don't have to be a muso or like uh know much about music. You can kind of make it through appropriation and or at least that's when it, the way it started and kind of, you know, had this uh do it yourself aspect to it really, which was pretty punk. And um yeah, I mean, I just like, um, I like, yeah, I like a lot of Chicago um, hip hop. You know, with the, with the book now in the past, and but do you find, does the lyrics update the story at all that's directly related to where you left off in the book? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I didn't really like, I mean, I feel like um, that was several years ago. And um, I don't know, I, I, it has more to do with this kind of, text I started writing or wrote for the, an art show about pitching a TV show and just kind of it was an excuse to make observations about other things and throw it into the mix and um, I guess, yeah I wasn't really thinking of it in that way you could <laughs> <laughs> We do because, you know if if you're a fan, we, we kind of hang on to the words and of course we're going to try to draw the connections so it's but I don't have to be right, obviously <laughs> What about the live band? What's the live show on this gonna gonna sound like? I mean, are you are you specifically mm-hmm. taking this album out on the road? And, and if so, who's playing with you? Well, yeah, I have to put a band together. Um, a couple of different people play drums, but there are only drums on a couple songs. So it'll probably have um, someone will be like kind of putting it together with me in terms of being able to use backing tracks and or files and mixed with some live musicians and it, it might be more of a like an art performance vibe i don't know <laughs> it'll be weird i hope so <laughs> <laughs> um is, is there any reason to play any of your older songs that you took the vocals on for sonic youth when you're out there no i mean i can't really think of i don't have any desire for that i mean even if i played all the songs on this record it's only 40 minutes so i have to think of some way to maybe write some new songs or something. But um, I I can't really think of any Sonic Youth songs that I'd be able to pull off unless I just did a a cappella. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't complain. We're, we're close to a bull in the heather here. It gets played all the time here in Louisville just because of the Kentucky Derby and everything. That's become a bit of a, oh, yeah. a yearly anthem. And the um, the mythology that runs out of that, because it was one of the guys from Pavement used to live over here. I forget which one. And, and there was always this... Bob. Yeah, Bob. And there was always a rumor yeah. that, that you all had come to one of his parties during the Derby. But did that ever happen? No. 
<laughs> never went to his party. So. Dispelling that right now, finally. But we did a lot of uh, gigs with pavement, so could have worked. Every out. night was a party. <laughs> A uh, ping pong party. A ping pong party? Yeah, kind of. Uh, just like with the table. Yeah, I mean, well, they had on um, Lollapalooza, they had a ping pong table. I think I've seen oh. some of that video, the video footage. All right. Uh, uh, congratulations on the record. I love it so much, and it's so great to hear from you, and I can't wait to catch one of these weird shows <laughs> that you're going to put on. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, Kim. Take care. And a huge thanks. Kim Gordon, once again, the uh, debut solo album is called No Home Record, and it's out now. And it's one of my favorites of the year, so don't pass it up. Now, it was just last year in 2018 was the uh, most recent time that Kim and I had caught up, which revolved around the uh, 20th anniversary of the Sonic Youth record, A Thousand Leaves, and the 30th anniversary of the epic classic Daydream Nation. So we got to talk about both of those, as well as her projects in the art world, the improv sounds of the band Body Head, and the song Murdered Out. And it was the song Murdered Out that eventually led to this new solo record, so I thought this is an easy tie with the interviews. So check this one out as well to get even more of the story. It's part two of Kyle Meredith with Kim Gordon. Oh, hey, hi. Let's start out with just you know what, what you've been up to, because the last we heard of you musically <laughs> was uh, uh-huh. you, you put out the single Murdered Out, and that was 2016. And it was a one-off single, but I thought at the time, surely I thought, oh, this means that there's more on the way, maybe, a, I don't know, a solo record or something. And that assumption mm-hmm. was wrong. <laughs> Um, well, I am going to do a solo record. I'm not sure. I don't think I'm doing it with that person, but uh, who I worked with on that. But uh, it's going to be uh, the person that I'm working with is really busy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, I don't know. It's, it might take a while. <laughs> yeah. So no timeline on that. But w- was that ever the um, was that ever the thought when that song came out that the, you, you I mean that there was going to uh, be more to go with it, or was that always meant to be a one off? Well, you know, I just really hadn't. It was just something that happened, so I hadn't really, um, you know, planned anything more right then. I mean, it was kind of uh, everything takes so long. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, and now, Body Head, we have a record coming out um, in July, July thirteenth, yeah. on Matador. So, oh, with Body Head, um, yeah. So, if I do have a solo record, it'll be like next year. You're also on the new Stephen Malcolmus record, I've heard. Which yes, is, I am. <laughs> what's your involvement there? What do you what, what do you what are you uh, what are you doing on that record? Oh, I'm just doing a duet. It's like a it's just sort of a faux country song about marriage, I think. <laughs> yeah, so that was fun. Can you uh, can you tell me about any more about the Body Head record while we're here? Is that it's still? Just, it's really heavy, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know what to think of the Body Head record, but <laughs> it's. Uh, it's quite different than the first one, so yeah. I don't know. It's just heavy. Let's do a thousand leaves because this album is turning twenty on May twelfth. Um, I, I don't feel like this is an album that gets celebrated very often. I mean, there's just so many, you know, Sonic Youth records that people turn to, and I, this one's sort of. I want to tell you, I had the poster of that on my wall for like most of my the second half of my teenage years. <laughs> oh wow. Take the trip down memory lane. Like, what comes to mind, if anything, when you think back to that record? Well, I mean, I know that we were, um, I think it was very influenced by, uh, you know, having our own studio and we'd been putting out, um, doing these kind of more instrumental, kind of just more experimental things on SYR. What was our last more kind of really song-oriented record? Was was it Dirty? No, it was... was, uh, uh, experimental jet set, I think. Yeah, yeah, jet set and washing machine between this one and washing machine. Yeah, yeah, and then a thousand leaves was after washing machine, mm-hmm. or was it? Yeah, that's right. Anyway, I guess we sort of, you know, washing machine. <laughs> I'm talking about another record. That's all right. Uh, I think we felt like that was a really good recording experience. It felt the recording felt very naturalistic, and you know the whole. A kind of career of Sonic Youth, the whole time people would always say, oh, your records don't sound like you do live, you know, and and I think after a while we sort of gave up trying to do that because also it's kind of dumb because people are listening to something on a giant speaker, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, you know, it's just a live experience. This is totally different. I mean, some people really try to replicate their records, I guess, and that's like a point of kind of honor, or not honor, but to be exacting in that way. And um, we were never that sort of band anyway. So um, I think 
that though there was something about, you know, the recordings that seemed always to separate us from the music, which is, and the feeling of playing live and what the music sound like playing live. So Washing Machine felt, even though it did have a lot of reverb on things, I think, uh, it did feel like a kind of naturalist kind of sounding record. And so when we went back to our own studio, which actually we we could have our own studio because we then toured Lollapalooza and we took <clears throat> some of that money and invested it and made our own studio. So we could then record more and uh, we started doing this like SYR record because that we didn't want to be put through some like bigger, big kind of record company machinery of prom- promotion and blah, 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 blah. Because it's so frustrating. You know, you just, you have to wait so long to put a record out. <laughs> Anyway, so A Thousand Leaves, I think, was very influenced by that process. When I look back, especially, you know, 1998, I thought the old scene, you know, that that you guys had released Goo and Dirty in, that sort of drifted out by that point. You know, we're getting into the late 90s, almost to the Mm -hmm. rap rock and and cock rock takeover uh, of radio Mm -hmm. and everything. But I thought, you know, it, it, it almost was probably a nice thing for you all because once that certain spotlight had kind of shifted that way, it seems like it would take the pressure off. Because when I listen to this now, when I listen to A Thousand Leaves now, it almost sounds like one of the first times that Sonic Youth sounded like you were really comfortable and on your own speed. Yeah, that's. I guess that's what I mean by naturalistic or something. Like We weren't sort of trying something out that was out of our comfort zone in a way. I mean, you know, serious. We recorded. We like to record it serious sound because they had like two inch, and you know, it's very analog sounding and and all that. But you know, I even remember the last record we recorded there. I guess today was experimental, like working with Butch Big. We kind of got into this thing of saying, "Well, that's good enough," <laughs> you know, instead of going back and redoing take after take. Because I feel like with like Dirty and Goo. You know, we, we basically really took the rock thing as far as we could and then ultimately found it sort of less satisfying when we saw where it was kind of going. Like you were saying also, like we kind of just hit a wall with it and then it's almost like we just became more introverted or something. <laughs> yeah, so that sort of makes sense. Yeah, that's when I started loving Sonic Youth the most, when you became introverted. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. I mean, I I don't even remember what that what's on that record or what it sounds like to tell you the truth. Well, there's the, there's uh, three yeah. three songs that I'll bring up. Um, first, Sunday was the big single uh, off of it. Was I guess oh, the only okay. yeah, single yeah, yeah. off of it. Which, as yeah. I look back on now, I don't remember seeing it. But you had Macaulay Culkin in the video, right? Yeah, it was sort of Thurston and Macaulay Culkin. Oh, okay. I I think Harmony shot it. Harmony Corinne. Yeah. Yeah. I see him. And back. it was kind of like he had this idea he wanted to do so. You know, a couple of your songs that I'll point out, um, especially because it, there's always with a lot of your lyrics, they've held on, they, they've they've aged well, and I'm going to say they aged well in really fortunate and interesting ways. Because uh, the first track is, uh, I'm going to try to say it, "Contra le Sexism," um, which I think uh. transfers to "Against Sexism," and then the female mechanic. And listening to those okay. now, and the things that you were talking about. Uh, and all the way back, especially to your very famous line and cool thing that people are holding up on posters everywhere now. You know, this all eventually comes out to the Me Too movement that's been in the last uh, the last year or two years and everything. And I don't know if you have a reaction to that, a feeling of that, but that's got to have some kind of positive effect on you that I would think. Well, and it's, it's funny. I mean, I actually, but it's sort of like the way the media works and it's just sort of like, well, sexism didn't just happen now. <laughs> You know, so, you know, and I don't know, I guess when we signed to Major Label, I think I really felt like, okay, I actually have a platform here that, like, I can write a song about anything. And it almost kind of, I felt challenged by it, like, I, you know, to step up to the plate or something. Like, so many people write love songs or that, and it's kind of like, well, as a woman, I had so many things I could write songs about as subject matter, and... um like there was like swimsuit issue, you know, like right after we signed a guest and I think there was kind of a big A&R person who was called out for sexual harassment and, um, and it was kind of a big deal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I think we felt 
not only had we signed and like you know accused of selling out signing to a major label but it was like one that had this particular scumbag you know but of course it was just like he was probably the tip of the iceberg or you know like no one just talked about it Mm -hmm. um but you know i was really i really deeply felt like uh the sexism coming from this corporate world and um you know things like they'd have like secretary day um but they wouldn't necessarily like give us help kind of nurture secretaries into other jobs or, you know, like promoting them or, you know, and, you know, so that was kind of, I, you know, I think it's uh, funny. It's just funny how things come around. They don't go away, you know, and, uh, but I, I actually had totally forgotten that I written that song. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, well, I guess, and also a female mechanic, you know, I don't, you know, I just kind of, kind I guess I, what the nice thing, I guess that I'm trying to, to say with that is, you know, when we would see those stories in the 90s, it was almost like those people, even if they got in trouble, it would just be like a stern slap on the wrist a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. And I don't know about the, yeah, the situation you're specifically sure. speaking to, but I, a lot of times that happened. Whereas now it feels like, you know, whether whether the huge ball keeps rolling in the way that we all hope it does, but, you know, those those mountains are starting to crumble. And, and, and like I said, to, for you to be such a voice of that and and interestingly with words you said 20 years ago and 25 years ago to still have such an impact and and to be so inspiring you know to women marching and and you know traveling across the country to 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 walk on washington yeah no i don't know like it was so funny because it was just such a but that inspiration for the cool thing lyrics came from a couple different sources and i almost meant it like it was just like one of those lyrics on that. They did actually eventually, I guess now they mean something. <laughs> but I, I, I was kind of thinking of, uh, of uh, you know, I was inspired by a Raymond Pettibone film and Jane Fonda and L. Cool J. You know, like it was, but uh, yeah. I mean, it, it is interesting. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Do you really think it's, I, I just feel like, I guess I'm a little pessimistic though. I, I just kind of feel like, People have such short attention spans, and it is like all the sexual harassment stories coming out. It's all kind of built on like such a culture of sexism, you know, that it's so deeply ingrained and it's genetically in, ingrained. And I don't know, I just hope it still kind of keeps moving forward with some momentum, you know? Yeah. It, I think it's just everyone's so starved for that change to finally happen because. It's been so long coming. It's such yeah, a long that, that time could coming. Be, you know. Yeah, but at yeah, the it's same been time, repressed so long. Yeah, at the same time, we have a dude in the office who has been sued by dozens of women, and nothing right. will happen. Nothing will happen. Yeah, because there's so many kind of uh, white male kind of you know small thinkers in office, and I don't think we're going to solve the world's problem with that. But <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate you. Uh, in, in that in that sort of idea right there, as I know a lot of folks uh, do. That's um, great, thanks. So let's turn to another record then, uh, which you pointed out to me. I I, uh, I hadn't been I wasn't paying attention to the thirty year anniversary, but in October, uh, Daydream Nation turns thirty years, and I think every I feel like everything's been said about that record because there are literally books written about that record. <laughs> How does it sit with you in a catalog, you know, to be held on such a pedestal like that? Like, do you have the same emotions that I think people uh, ri- give that album rise to? Um, you know, I I sort of didn't until we, um, you know, because once a record's done, you just kind of, you sort of have to forget about it. And then you go out and you play the songs and they take on sort of a new a life of their own. But when we did relearn the, that record and start playing it live again, I it had such a different feeling than all our other songs after that. And you know, it's like it's so dense, and it was actually just such an intense uh, uh, um, thing to play. But like listening to it, I don't know. It's not as I didn't get the the sense of the songs individually of having that much power. But actually playing the songs was really hard <laughs> and in in the sense that it was just really a lot of energy and and maybe it was also coming out of uh, you know being influenced by hardcore and just you know, super like dense kind of music that was around us 
yet at that time it ends up being you know i guess your most accessibly <laughs> as a pop record that you guys had ever done it, which is interesting uh, that that's what the influences were coming from you know that um you ended up on the charts with yeah. that record yeah it's, it's weird yeah, were, uh, yeah. were you aware <laughs> uh well i guess i should say when did you start to become aware that it was taking on that life that it eventually did i don't know you know it was just a kind of gradual i guess because people would yeah mention it as in our best record or something. Yeah. It's in the Library of Congress now. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. That was a moment. I forgot. And I remember, yeah, being like we're in Japan or something when they had the Paz and Jap pull. And it was like number one. And I remember being just completely surprised. I don't know. I mean, to have, you know, we talk about these records, to have something that dominated your life for 30 years and, and then for it to be done and gone. Do, do you feel the absence of Sonic Youth or is it still people like me making it constantly circle around you <laughs> i mean i don't feel the absence of it because i kind of felt like we sort of took it as far as we could and i don't know also i'm just kind of sort of busy with other things now able to like assume making art more um which is kind of the most important thing to me and also i love playing with bill like i just i love playing i love body head you know i just kind of just I love the freedom of it. And that's, you know, I'll try not to make that part of the, this interview too awkward either because, you know, it's well written about how Sonic Youth kind of came to an end and why it came to an end, you know, without getting into your personal life. But, but that was sort of the question, you know, like had Sonic Youth made their final record one way or the other? Was, was that happening regardless? Yeah, I mean, it's possible. You know, I think, um, you know, when it gets, you know, I think that we had a lot of good, times and good moments and kind of amazing that the band was able to become as big as it was I, you know i just can't imagine what it would be like starting a band now <laughs> that was you know writing songs or indie rock or whatever and like i i just kind of feel pretty much like you know dynamics in a band get old and it's kind of like it's better to stop before you know it's just all the good times get forgotten you know right right there's a lot of great music in there um i certainly do appreciate every bit of it i'm I'm always excited about what you're doing next like i said uh, i thought murdered out was was i I was so taken aback by it one it just kind of came out of nowhere but it was such a good song and so great to hear you sort of in that um in that style and mode as well Uh so yeah no i I would i would like to do or actually with that producer too. I think, you know, I might, I, I probably will, but I think um, there'll be like one off or something. Well, yeah. I thank you for the time, uh, especially uh, you gave me a lot of time here. I really appreciate that. But, um, Oh, sure. Yeah. And I look forward to, um, to the new body head. So maybe we can, uh, you know, ch- catch up more when that, when that happens. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, yeah, definitely. We'll get Bill on the phone too and make it a big thing. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, take care. Um, is there anything else we should know about? Actually, I should ask. You just did an art show, so I didn't know if you had any more of those coming up. That was uh... oh yeah. Well, it's um it's up until the twenty eighth in L A. There's like a narr- There's actually a kind of a narration part to it, as well as the painting and sculpture, and there's like sound effects in the room and stuff. Where is it? It's at this um, gallery in L A. called Rena Spalling's Fine Art. They have one in New York, and then they share the space with. Um, another gallery from Mexico City. They kind of, every other month, they curate a show. And yeah, I'm really happy with it. Yeah, and how long is that up? Until uh, April 28th. Well, awesome. Um, I don't think I can get to April in that time, but I hope some of our listeners can. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. awesome, Kim. Well, thank you so much again, and uh, it was great talking to you. You too. All Have right. a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. Kim Gordon, that's back from uh, 2018 right there as we got to talking about what would eventually become that solo record and those anniversaries of A Thousand Leaves and Daydream Nation. Now back it up just a few years right before that and it was the first time that I got to talk with Kim and Bill Nace of Bodyhead. They were together. We were backstage at the Big Ears Festival down in Tennessee and we got to chat about the debut Bodyhead record called Coming Apart. So I'm going to drop that one in here as well. It's part three with Kim Gordon. Hi. So we're at the uh, we're at the uh, the Big Ears Festival here in Knoxville, Tennessee, which you guys are a part of, and it seems like this that there is no more perfect festival created that you guys could be a part of than what's going on right here. Uh, I don't know what we say. It was it, it's it's like innovators or those folks who are skirting the art and pop world. 
and you fit in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just sort of zooming around the edges of, of everything. Yeah. Well, do you see yourself as part of a, a, a club that's going on here? Yeah, yeah. kind of. I like, mean, we're literally like, yeah, we're kind of. Uh, I don't know what our. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't have to categorize what yeah, you are. Not, we never feel like we're actually in the club, wherever the club, whatever the club. Yeah, is. I just don't see like where, for a lot of festivals, there's uh, you couldn't take a yearbook photo of it, but th this one, it seems like you could actually take a nice yearbook photo of yeah. everyone and it's no, going to make great. sense. Right, you know? right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's this type of music, it's what's going on here that I guess it's, I mean, could you, could you ever imagine anything like this ever going, mainstream's probably not the right word, but somewhere like the accessibility and everything, because it's, there's really interesting stuff. And I guess what I'm getting to is, uh, you know, you guys aren't what I'd say a rock band, and everybody here is not a rock band, but in the in the in the realm of rock and pop, you know, we, you hit those walls mm -hmm. every few years, and it takes something moving it forward, and it feels like we could get something out of this. These these are the artists that are trying that, but do you ever feel like these are the artists who could ever be? I don't know what's a good example. I think that idea though of the mainstream kind of breaking into that in that way is a little like not as relevant yeah. nowadays. It's more about like access, mm -hmm. which is, um, I think, easier than it used to be to kind of, you know, check out a wide array of, of things. I mean, I guess you don't need a radio hit anymore just to be, Exa right, right. to make a living, you know. Right. Or to not make a living. <laughs> right. <laughs> Did you make a living off your radio hits? That's a good question. I don't, and we didn't have any radio hits. Yeah. But, um, no, I mean, I think that uh, there's something interesting about, um, you know, maybe eccentricity is, is a kind of a way you could describe even some of the bands that are playing. Yeah. You know, like television. Or, right, or, right. But, but I think it's just kind of accumulated, um, um, yeah, people getting uh, sort of years of that, you know, dissonance and mm -hmm. that kind of music, like filtering up and... Um, you know, I think uh, basically anything can also be marketed. Sure. You know, like the Red Bull Academy did this festival that, I mean, I don't know how many people actually went. It wasn't like um, Lollapalooza or anything. <laughs> it was a... But they called it drone music, which I would never, I think right. very specifically drone music as like, um, you know, minimalist classical music mm -hmm. um, or the Velvet, I guess I can see how people think right, of the right. Velvet Underground as drone music, but. I don't think of that. I don't think of it as drunk. Well, I mean, we look at it as history books now, so it's 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 through that filter. Yeah, you know, but there. people seem to have glommed onto that word as something sure. that is. Um, well, didn't we just call it shoegaze at one point? There was a catch-all with shoegaze as well. That if it yeah, just well, was, that was more pop though. Yeah, slow and murky, and it's like right. it was, there was yeah. shoegaze, you know. Yeah. I just think having improvised music at a festival is kind of, you know, not not the norm. Well, it's not jam band improvised music. Right. It's not like right, free right. jazz not, or something like that. Right. No, but we it's we're improvised, and I'm yeah. I'm not sure. I I imagine the the Hino trio is maybe has some imp improvisation going on. Yeah. yeah. So I just think to have that at a festival is pretty, you know, not usual, right. which, is, which is nice. Well, that's a great lead in actually to to your uh, record and everything. So it's the debut Bodyhead record, and there is a certain amount of improv into that. Uh, yeah, and I've read about, you know, that there was some structure to it, but there was also a lot of uh, free range and how that plays towards the live show. Because mm -hmm. when did it come out? I mean, this record's now, what's September. September. Yeah, so what, seven months or whatever that yeah. is. DJ math. Mm -hmm. uh, just it's, it's somewhere in the 12 months or whatever. Uh, so, I mean, it couldn't have started out anything like the record, but now what are those, uh, are they completely different? Have you guys found that there is any kind of structure to these songs on any given night? Well, we're really not playing this. I mean, it, it literally, okay, the record literally was completely improvised. Okay. And then, um, I, and including the lyrics and the vocals, mm -hmm. but then I went back and overdubbed some other lyrics, and we did some shaping and a little bit of editing and a couple of guitar overdubs, but... Um, so you know, you're not playing The only thing that, that remains is, well, no, we could never recreate it. Sure. It was completely made up in the moment so and it's our whole career is that is what we do live on stage yeah. so the only thing that's really carried over are some lyric ideas but basically the, but as far or as just things that we do because it's who we are and that's yeah. how we play yeah like yeah. our yeah vocabulary playing sure. and you know we're so kind of used to playing together that um 
So I like to think of it as sort of scripted improvisation, mm -hmm. but it's really unscripted improvisation, <laughs> <laughs> really. Yeah. Well, I guess it's I guess it's what what the set list looks like. Like, it, well, how does a set list look? You know, yeah. does it say abstract on it? You're you like, no, have a no, set list. no, no. That, that's what I'm getting. But at. you, you know, when we tour in Europe, you know, we we um, you know for publishing, they always want the names of the songs, so we just put down the names <laughs> of like the songs on the record. I guess. It's, yeah. You know. They wouldn't know. It's just, they wouldn't, they what, wouldn't what are you know. Do? It's, yeah. Just, yeah. it's funny. Uh, Bill, I, I know that you've said in the previous bands you didn't work a lot with, uh, with vocalists. It wasn't a lot of vocalists. Now, once again, you've had time. You know, what, what, what has that been like for you? Um, and have you found new tricks over these months, you know, to, to how that uh, shapes? New tricks, how? Of, of working with it, because you played a voice. I, I read an interview that said you can, you've learned how to play to voice, and it's a very different thing. Oh, no, thing. no. I, I wasn't saying I learned how to play to it, more just that it's um, cha like changed how I play with other people or how I approach it. But the, I mean, you can, you can kind of get away with more as well in terms of, because the way Kim sings, it kind of ties it together, mm -hmm. and I think it gives it that kind of song quality. It's the Lebowski but, rug. Yeah. <laughs> 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 exactly well, like Bill's that. favorite movie. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we can, I don't mean get away, but we can kind of work with more abstract musical pieces right. that then the vocals kind of tie it together and make it something that I don't think it would be without the vocals. So just for me, I had never really played with that that much, so it was just kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, I played with vocalists, but more people that did also like kind of really just you know, abstract kind of sure. extended technique type of stuff. I mean, there's a million genres out there and, and kind of putting in a box of just what we know, you know, usually as rock pop, it's, it's so foreign to hear like someone talking about not playing with a vocalist that much you know, right, and, right. and learning it this far uh, into a career. Right. Um, the, the exciting thing about Body Head, and I guess with what you guys are saying too, it, it doesn't really seem like there's a road map mm -hmm. uh, much at all. I mean, I, I, I don't know how you see it. This, is this a project or is this your band? It's our band. It's a band. It's, it's yeah. a band. Is yeah. it the band right now? Or we, had it, the, we had the name Star Wars. Like, let's yeah. make it. No, band. it's a band. So. Yeah. And, and, and I guess that's what I said, you know, and, and Kim, maybe it's because, you know, you've, you've been through many projects that we call projects, you know, and, and I guess that's the um, splitting hairs, the definitions between what's a band and what's a project. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. do we get to have more body head records, you know, down the line and, mm -hmm. and that type of stuff? Yeah. I mean, I haven't really done that many projects. I think project gets used projects. when there's like a main. You know, it's like Free Kitten was a band, so. sure, but sure. Sonic Youth was happening, so then people kind of... Sonic Youth was a project, Free Kitten was a Exactly, yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's all like where your entry point into that is. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think it means that much. Yeah. It might not happen on this level, and you know, maybe this is an awkward question with it, but you know, have you had any problem finding your place given, you know, Sonic Youth and the history of everything like that, you know, coming from you? Where you are, because there's a spotlight. Obviously, when you walk out, and this is a new band, it's Body Head, but it's here's Kim Gordon. Have you found any problem finding a place in it? Finding a place. I don't know if if saying in the spotlight is the right thing, but just saying like this is a <laughs> duo and not once again a project. Um, no, I mean I think because it's a duo, there's not much of a issue with that. I mean, yeah. It, you know, it kind of is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kim, for you then, was it, was it, you know, any means for reinvention? Because there is so, uh, similarities in sound to what we're used to hearing from you. But did you ever step out and said, I could completely reinvent myself with this? Um, well, I don't know, I didn't really think about it so consciously. I just yeah. felt like I want to just, you know, I like playing with Bill and... I just thought, oh, great, now I can just play exactly what I want to play. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the and, captain now. <laughs> and um, it's, no, I mean, it's just, um, you know, pl playing with only one other person, um, it's just easier to focus sure. on the music, for one thing. And um, also, I don't know, I just thought, we're just going to make this music. I, we didn't really think beyond just going down in the basement and starting to record. and. And um, then starting to do some shows. Um, yeah, people always want like a narrative of something that's beyond just like. This is what happened. I like to play music, yeah, and right. you know, we have to feel, feel space sometimes. <laughs> right, that's true. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I you know, I wasn't actually thinking. I was thinking more. I would just concentrate on art. But I um, I did miss playing, and it was fun to do something I thought 
you know, I wouldn't have to promote. Yeah, <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, and then if you like it, then you want people to come see it. Sure. So. Well, we love it, and that's the great thing about this. I mean, luckily it worked. Do you mind if I ask how the book's going? Because uh, there's going to be a bio, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's going. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, my deadline is April. <laughs> oh, the, the way you're saying that doesn't, doesn't sound too promising. Um, let's just say I should be at the hotel writing. Right yeah. Now. Do you, have you no, found it, 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 has it been surprising at all how much people, from the moment we heard there was going to be a bio, they were like, oh. I mean, salivating, you well, know, at the actual story. I mean, it's not going to be a Sonic Youth bio. Sure. So, I mean, there's, you know, things about, of course, writing about different songs uh -huh. and recording and different stories about that, but it's, 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 its purpose isn't to make a Sonic Youth hat. Uh, fan totally happy. Yeah. It's Did, like so you went into it actually. <laughs> so just set your bar. Just low. like the band. <laughs> I, you know, please. Yeah, I want everyone to set their bar low. Yeah. Did, did you go into <laughs> it with that idea? Yeah. <laughs> did you have that idea when you went into it when they said, "Hey, let's write a book"? Did, I mean, did you have to think what, what what is the book? What's the angle? Um. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess you would have to instead of just. Yeah, you, you make a proposal. It. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I don't know the book world. Yeah. I don't know how it works. Did you? I did, have. Have you read all of the other like unauthorized biographies that have your life in it? No. Did you ever open any of those? Because there's quite a few out there. Uh, they're all really awful. Pretty. Are they? Yeah. yeah. They're boring. Um, I mean, the only one that's actually. I mean, they're not awful, but they're just. You know, they don't have any context to them. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, the best one is actually this catalog, um, Sensational Fix, from a show art exhibit that unfortunately didn't come here because it was the recession was going on. But they went to seven or eight museums in Europe, and it was an um, exhibit that had to do with artists we were influenced by and collaborated with. Yeah. And just, it was less really about Sonic Youth, but it had individually some of our artwork and some ephemera and stuff from Sonic Youth, but it was it was a kind of an interesting um, context yeah. for the for the band, and it, it's really the best book on Sonic Youth. I think I'm Byron so. Coley is going to write the uh, the ultimate. Yeah, it's good with the one. <laughs> you know, like leave the, those details. <laughs> one of these days. Uh, well, good luck on the April deadline, and uh, and thanks for giving us Body Head, both of you guys. Thanks. It was thanks great for meeting you both. Us, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks for having thanks. us. All right. Kim Gordon, Bill Nace, the band Body Head. That comes from a 2014 interview talking about their record called Coming Apart. And that does it for this episode, too. Once again, a huge thanks to Kim Gordon. The new record is out now. Do check it out. And thanks to you for uh, for listening all this way, too. Don't forget, before you get out of here, if you're a subscriber, maybe you can give the series a rating wherever you're listening from. Uh, leave a review if you can do that. If you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button because we put out a new interview every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So keep up with us. Just type in Kyle Meredith with wherever you're listening to your podcast from. Hit that subscribe button right now. You can also do that in places like Spotify and YouTube as well. After that, head to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of uh, song premieres, of music news, anniversary spins, and even more interviews. That's WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound has your music and film news. You can also find me at Twitter at Kyle Meredith and Facebook slash Kyle Meredith. And that does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.